I want you to go with me, take a little journey with me today, something I believe is significant and even critical for us as a church right now. In the book of Joshua, I want you to listen to someone's testimony. This is an amazing story, an amazing record of someone's life. Joshua 14, beginning in verse number 6, a delegation from the tribe of Judah, led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea. I, here's what he said. It, I think that's what he said, unless I went too far. Is that the next one? I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. So that day, Moses solemnly promised me the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as He promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. And I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. So Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave Hebron to him as his portion of land. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. How many families can say, we still have the spiritual inheritance that was given to us in the beginning? Now that's what Caleb says. That's what he says about himself and about God. But what does God say about Caleb? That's what really matters. Not what we say as much as it is what God says. So here's what God says about Caleb. This is in Numbers 14, verse number 24. For Caleb, though, it's a different matter. He's distinct from the others. How'd you like God to say that about you? About your family, about your household, about your church. He's distinct from the others by having a different spirit and has followed my lead wholeheartedly. I will make sure that he is able to enter the land and to live in it, he and his descendants after him. That is the word of the Lord concerning Caleb. What about this man, Caleb? What do we know about him? Well, no, several things about him. One, he was an actual person. This guy's not a comic book character. He's not a superhero. 
uh, in, a, in a book. Uh, he is an actual person. Caleb actually lived. He is a historical figure. He's not a, uh, a, a character type or composite. He's not an avatar. He's a real person. Amen. He's an actual person. He lived. But he's also a believable person because he literally went through and faced life the same way we do. His life was not a whole lot different than ours. Uh, he faced the same kind of issues, same kind of circumstances. He did life just pretty much like we have to do life. Life for him is pretty much like life for us. Another thing we know about him is he's an old covenant person, which means that he is on the opposite side of the cross from us. He's on the other side of the cross. Now that makes a difference because when you're on this side of the cross, you have access and advantage that the people on the other side of the cross did not have. So it is no fair saying today, well, Caleb was advantaged in ways that I'm not because he was on the other side of the cross. You see, the cross is the divine line of demarcation. It divides all of earthly history and all spiritual realities. Everything was judged at the cross. The devil was judged at the cross. The demons were judged. Sin was judged. Sickness was judged. Shame was judged. Everything was judged. All circumstances were judged at the cross. On top of that, God's word was judged at the cross. And it was determined by the cross to be faithful and true. So when you see Jesus in Revelation, what you see... Jesus, the, the, the name on him as he's riding the horse is what? And on his thigh are written the name faithful and true because everything that God has declared was judged faithful and true at the cross. Now, so that means that you and I, we look back to what has already been done. Caleb had to look forward. He had to look ahead. He was looking into the future for the fulfillment. We look back, so therefore we say, by his stripes, no, we are not, not by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we were healed. Read it for it's Peter. By his stripes we were healed. Caleb on this end had to look this way and say, by his stripes I will be. Because they're looking forward ahead, we have the advantage to look back. Nothing wrong with looking back because every fulfillment has already been secured in the cross. So I look back for my forgiveness. I look back for my freedom, back for my liberty. Everything occurred at the cross. So my access and advantage comes because I'm on this side of the cross. Anybody who's on this side of the cross, I think, has a distinct advantage. We have the Holy Spirit in the fullness. We have revelation and understanding that Caleb did not have. There were things that God could not reveal then that he does now. So he's an old covenant guy. Another thing about him, I want to call him a dangerous man. He's a dangerous person. You know why? Because he just believed what God said. <laughs> In fact, he would so believe what God said, whatever God said, he would believe it. So much so that he held on to a promise from God for 45 years. Wow. Now that's a dangerous guy. Because those are the kind of people that don't quit. Those are the kind of people who, when they face their enemies, prevail over their enemies. So there is no enemy that's safe when Caleb's around. No giant is going to be secure when Caleb's around because he is a very dangerous guy. But he's also, one last thing I want to give you, he's, very, he, he's what I would call an exceptional guy because he is the, the person, one of the people in the Old Testament especially, that it serves to be such a great example and inspiration for every follower of Jesus. God lifts him up as an inspiration for us. We can look to him and receive encouragement and exhortation and strength in our lives. And it's because he is, has a different spirit. The word 
different there. It means a different way of thinking, uh, a different attitude. Uh, he is a different kind of man. And so I believe that whatever God is highlighting in him is something that we need because the word different means unusual, it means unique, it means not normal. And I believe that what God is showing us today is literally the new normal in Caleb. What is this different spirit? And so today, what I want to do is sort of break this down and uh, take a look at this guy and see how he got this different spirit. How is it that he had this and not very many other people, if anybody else did? How was it? Well, let's take a look at some things. First thing is this. Let's take a look at his history. Caleb was probably born in Egypt. He was, if he was born in Egypt, he was born into slavery. He was born into oppression. He was born into bondage. He was born into a heavy uh, indebtedness to Pharaoh. If you were living in Egypt, you were under the thumb of Pharaoh. So he lived probably for the first 40 years of his life under the oppression of Pharaoh. So Caleb knows what slavery is all about. He knows what bondage is all about. He knows what it means to be living under the power and penalty of your own sin because he was there. He lived in Egypt. He was under that. But God gave him a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get out. Just like you and I. We got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get out. God came through his love through Jesus and says, hey, you want out of that? If you want out of that, you can get out of that. And Caleb took God up on that and had an encounter with God somewhere, somehow, that got him out of that and into his journey with God. Now, I want to tell you something. When you encounter God, it changes your life. Now, I'm telling you, in this day, modern day, fast food, drive through, shortcut, drop box, Snapchat lifestyle that everybody has, we got people today who are praying sinners' prayers, but they're not encountering God. This man encountered God. So much so that he got all out of that and whatever was on him and over him and hanging on him came off of him when he got out of Egypt. Now, you know, at the beginning of the week, I don't know, it's just the way my brain works. I started contemplating how much indebtedness I have been released from by God. It started dawning on me. Forgive me for being so basic and simple, but I, I just began to be overwhelmed by the fact that my debt had been paid by God. Let me show you what I found in the book of Matthew. Here is a scripture that sort of highlights the indebtedness of a man to God. This is right in the middle of the parable. Matthew 18, 24. When the king began to collect his money, and this is the expanded Bible version, the settlement or the reckoning, a servant or a slave who owed him several million dollars or billions of dollars, now watch, they're not done yet. 10,000 talents is what the Scripture says. But a talent was worth about 6,000 days wages. This is an impossibly high debt. This guy was brought to him. Now, I started thinking about this. This is huge. Look at this. It takes 16 and a half years to earn one talent. If you work seven days a week, 365 days a year, it takes you six and 16 and a half years to earn one talent. So it would take 60 million days to achieve a payoff. 
60 million days is 165,000 years. And that's 2,000 lifetimes. And he wiped it away. No wonder this man has a different spirit. He got out from under all of that and encountered God. That is his history. You see, you're not going to have a different spirit if you're still indebted. And so God says to me now, look what I did for you. And you're going to hold what against who? Seriously? You're going to be upset about that because of them? Really? I think this man had a significant understanding of what God had brought him out of. It changes the way you see other people. It changes the way you live. Number one is history. Number two, I want to talk about his heritage for a minute. Caleb was not an Israelite. Caleb was a Kenizzite. His father was Jephunneh, a Kenizzite. You say, Pastor Buddy, how did this work? Well, the Kenizzites lived near Egypt. And it must have been that Caleb's father decided at some point that their family was going to be in Egypt. And when they were in Egypt... They had the opportunity to get out. Everybody does. Not everybody takes it. And these Kenizzites wanted to go out of Egypt. Jephunneh, Caleb. Caleb had a younger brother. His name was Kenaz. Whoever else was in the family. Their father decided to get them out of Egypt. But the only way out of Egypt was to become a part of the Israelite camp. But if you're going to journey with the Israelites, you have to have a tribe. Because all the numbering is done according to tribe. All the responsibility and the accountability and all of the camping and journeying and worshiping and and responsibility. Everything is done according to tribe. So you have to choose a tribe. And what this parent chose changed his family forever. Let me exhort you parents, do not ever think that your decisions do not impact your children. Because this man was eyeing these tribes. He had a decision to make. Am I going to become an Ephraimite? Am I going to become a a Simeonite? Am I going to uh, become a Danite? What am we going to become? And you have the same choice to make for you and your family. What are we going to become? Are we going to become staid, half-hearted, compromising, milky, toasty, insy, outsy, upsy, downsy Christians? Or are we going to be passionate people for God? Amen. You get to make that choice. And parents, whatever choice you make, your children will know it whether you tell them or not. They will know it. Because of the priority that you put on the presence of God, on the people of God, on the place where we meet, will tell your children what you think about it. So what does Jephunneh do? He decides, I'm going to attach my family to Judah. That's where we're going. I don't know where Judah's going, but we're going with Judah. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah because they assimilated into it. He wasn't born into it. 
He wasn't raised in it. Well, I don't have that because I wasn't raised. Forget about where you were raised. What are you attached to now? That father made a decision. I am going to attach and assimilate and align my family to Judah. And we are going to honor the presence of God. We are going to honor the things of God. We're going to honor the house. We're going to honor the people. And we will not let anything get in the way. Parents, let me tell you something. When you make choices for your family that show to your children that the presence of God and the things of God are not the highest priority in your family, you are teaching them to dishonor their God. My wife and I made a decision years and years and years ago. I know I don't look that old, but it still was years. (laughs) Hey, you want a wake-up call? Just get the old pictures out. My wife comes to me yesterday, look at these pictures I found. Man, I had brown hair then. <laughs> I showed one, I got a picture of Bernita. Anybody want to see what Bernita looked like 16 years ago? Oh, look at that. Ah! Oh! Hey, I'm going to tell you something. It's a wake-up call, right? We made a decision years and years ago that we would not never put any sort of leisure, entertainment, sports, anything above the priority of the presence of God in the house of God. My kids come to me and say, I want to play football. Fine. When do they play their games? Sunday morning. When do they practice? Wednesday nights. Well, we're not doing that. You know, I had a relative come to me one time and say, you know what, because you've chosen these rigid, uh, you know, pastoral things and you've given your life to pastoring, you're never going to have anything. (laughs) And all of your kids, are they're never going to be able to play the piano or anything. That's what they told me. You can't afford piano lessons, you know, you're just, you know, eating bread and water all the time because that's what pastors do, you know. (laughs) And... And let me tell you something. You want to know God always gets the last laugh. You cannot sacrifice and hurt yourself in God. Every one of my kids can play the piano. You might not want to listen to them, but they can play. I have one son that can play four instruments, another son that can play at least three. A daughter that plays the piano, but she has three children that she deals with, and that's worth about eight instruments. I'm telling you, if we had it to do over again, we would be just as strong as we are now. Because one of the things that we wanted to teach our children is there is nothing greater than the presence of God. Nothing. And because we weren't trying to run a popularity contest with our kids, it didn't matter when we said no. Hey, I'm not your friend, I'm your parent. You ever heard people say, oh, Jesus is my friend. Well, actually, he's king and Lord. And the first thing you better do is bow down. Not give him a high five. Get a little bit sloppy sometimes. So Caleb gets attached to Judah. Well, guess what he learns? Woo! <laughs> he learns to be a praiser. Because <laughs> Judah uses praise to magnify God, but they also use praise to defeat their enemies. They use praise to strengthen the camp. They use praise to encourage one another. They use the praise of God to do all these kinds of things. And Caleb gets in on that, and he starts saying stuff like this. Yep. This is how I want to do life. This is how I'm going to walk. This is how I'm going to journey. This is how I'm going to live. That's the way I'm, I'm going to be. You know, you see one of the great things about praisers? Praisers tend to be prevailers. When you see somebody who is a prevailer, you will find in there somewhere they have a high honor for the presence of God and the praise and thanks of God. It's in there somewhere because that's how people become prevailers. And Jephunneh, who, by the way, whose name means he will be prepared. 
lived out the prophetic name that God gave him because that's what he did for his kids. He prepared them to be prevailers. Because I want to tell you something. Okay, yeah, we're going to go and we're going to kick a soccer ball around on Sunday morning instead of being in church. Try hanging that on your hat when your kid's in trouble and they need to encounter God. What are you going to do, throw them a soccer ball? We reap what we sow. Caleb had a brother named Ken As. He got, he got exposed to. He was just as wild as Caleb. These guys got in because, man, this is, this is great stuff. We love this. this is what we, we don't want to be Kenizzites. We want to be Judites. We want to be but powerful praisers. And Kenaz got it too. And Kenaz passed it to his son. Kenaz had a son. His name was Othniel. Not Oatmeal. <laughs> Othniel. <laughs> you say, Pastor Buddy, who cares about Othniel? God does. Because he became one of the first judges of Israel. And you know what the mark of his life was? Everywhere he stretched out his hand, the Bible says he prevailed. He prevailed. He prevailed over his enemies. He prevailed. As long as he was a judge, Israel was prevailing over their enemies. That got passed down from the granddad who said, Yep, we're going to hook up. We're going to get in all the way. And down to Caleb, down to Kenaz, and then down to Othniel. Othniel was a judge just like Samson, just like Samuel, just like Gideon. Wasn't even an Israelite. Got in because they said, this is what we want. That's what happened to me. You would not want to have known me 40 years ago. I was a Kenizzite. And a parasite. <laughs> Horrible. So, you see, Caleb did not become a prevailer by accident, by chance. He did it because of his heritage. What he was linked to, what he was assimilated into, what he was connected to, attached to, and aligned with. Nobody is a prevailer on their own. It's by what we're attached to. And whatever you attach to will determine the direction of your life. You want to attach to the Kenizzites? That's what you'll be the rest of your life, a Kenizzite. Which, by the way, are going nowhere. The Father recognized it. Let's get on with them. Let's get on board with this. Let's get out of here and get into something that God has for us. Heritage. Number three, let me give it to you really quick. Oh, man. Uh, his heart. You got you to gotta do the heart thing because Moses mentioned it, Joshua mentioned it, Caleb mentioned it, God mentioned it. He's wholehearted. That means no division in the heart, no divided interests, no divided distractions, no divided loyalties, no divided. Because you see, a, double, a divided, double minded heart or mind. His Bible says is unstable in all its ways. So anytime I'm double anything, I'm unstable. But I believe the whole the wholeheartedness of Caleb goes much deeper than that. I believe that there was a real commitment on his part to walk in wholeness before the Lord. Amen. Because a lack of wholeness yes. is what slays us every time. It's what gets us off track. It's what gets us in a ditch. It's what gets us into a trap, into a snare, a lack of wholeness. And I just want to do this really quick. I want to give you, as an aside, I'm not charging for this. I'm going to just give you, on an aside, I want to give you the three symptoms of a lack of wholeness in someone's life. How does it show up? Because you see, when, when there's a lack of wholeness, it is what trips me up and keeps me from being a perseverer and a prevailer and keeps me from walking in longevity before the, the first one is this. Any, any place in my life where there is an unhealed hurt, an, an unaddressed issue, uh, whatever you want to call it, the first thing, the symptom is, it makes me feel like I'm missing out. There is something unquenched in me. There is something unfulfilled, unsatisfied. Uh, it's like an unscratched itch. Now, this is why 
people who love their spouses can end up having an affair. Because if there's an unhealed area, an unaddressed, unresolved area, it becomes an itch that you cannot scratch. And so they look to something else to scratch the itch. But what they look to won't scratch the itch either. My dad was a great guy. I'm honored that I'm his son. God, this is what God chose. Well, my dad had a lot of unhealed hurts in his life, had a lot of unresolved issues in his life going way back. He tried to scratch that itch with women, other women. Never worked. It never does. Because only Jesus can resolve. You see, I, I think this is what happened to Eve. Eve thought she was missing out if she didn't eat the fruit because there was something that was not yet addressed and resolved. That's the first one. The second one is, wherever there's an un something, a, a lack of wholeness in me, it makes me feel like I don't measure up. It creates in me a nagging insecurity, a nagging inferiority, a nagging intimidation, a nagging inadequacy to where I just don't feel like I add up. So what happens when people have an unresolved area that we answer that by becoming very self-focused, very self-aware, and walking in our own self-importance? Now, you see this happen all the time. People do that, but literally what they're trying to do is address the inferiority and the inadequacy that they are feeling on the inside. Because until Jesus touches that area of my life and brings wholeness to that, there is going to be a sense of inadequacy there. And the third, er the third symptom is this. I'm mired in the same responses and reactions over and over. I live with these pre-programmed responses and reactions. In other words, when something touches that lack of wholeness in me, I go into fear mode, or I go into anger mode, or I go into blame mode, or I go into fantasy mode, or I go into this, or I go into that. Whatever it is, I go into, I go into control mode. Some people do that. I believe that Caleb was walking with a significant amount of wholeness in his life. Otherwise, he could have never addressed and faced the things that he did. And let me just give them to you really quick, and then we're going to finish. Here it is. He weathered incredible disappointment. You say, Pastor Buddy, when was that? Where there were only two guys that were capable of taking over for Moses. And that was Caleb and Joshua, because everybody else was going to die. Anybody over the age of 20 was going to die. Caleb and Joshua were the only two guys over the age of 20 that weren't going to die. So it was between these two guys who happened to be best friends. They were confidants and, 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 and companions, one or the other. God chose Joshua, which means he didn't choose Caleb. He selected Joshua, which means he deselected Caleb. Caleb could have said, wow, I've just been rejected by God. I'm faithful. I, I've been walking with God. I, let me tell you something. There are people who do not recover after that kind of disappointment in their life. Who find it, and, and, and recognizing that it was God that was the one that did it on top of that. So here he is. He weathers that significant disappointment. The second one is he weathered significant and major major hardship in his life. He's the only one that had to face the three giants in Hebron. The three sons of Anak, he had to face them. By the way, those are the same three guys that they were talking about in Numbers 13 when they said, wow, these, they, those guys are in the land. We're never going to make it. He had to address those. You see, when you have to deal with hardship that no one else appears to be going through and no one else has to deal with, you start saying stuff like, well, God, why am I, why is this, how come this happened to me? Why do I have to do this? And yet Caleb weathered that, even though he had hardship in his life that no one else knew about, no one understood, no one else could measure that kind of hardness. He dealt with it and weathered it. 
You don't do that without a significant amount of wholeness working in your life. And the third thing that he dealt with was a significant amount of loss. Yeah. Here it is. God promised him you can have what? Hebron. Right? Here it is. Look at this. Joshua blessed Caleb. He gave him Hebron, right? Okay, that's, uh, that is chapter 14. Look what happens in chapter 21. Because between Joshua 14 and Joshua 21, Caleb goes in and he rescues and wins and fights and becomes victorious in Hebron. He defeats the, uh, the giants in Hebron and he possesses his possessions, right? J- now look at this in Joshua 21. Here's the rest of the story. The Israelites gave the following towns from the tribes of Judah and Simeon to the descendants of Aaron who were members of the Kohite clan within the tribe of Levi. Since the sacred lot fell to them first. God comes along in in Joshua 21 and says, there's a sacred lot. And so there's land inside Judah that actually belongs back to God now that he's going to give to the Levites. He's going to give to the Kohites. And look what he gave him. Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron in the hill country of Judah, along with its surrounding pasture land. Caleb had to give back to God the thing he believed God for for 45 years. Are you seriously kidding me? After 45 years of trusting you and believing you, I go in, I take the land, I'm victorious, I'm graced, I'm blessed, and then you come along and say, I have to give it back? Just like Zipporah had to give Moses away. Just like Hannah had to give Samuel away. Just like Abraham had to give Isaac away. Just like the father gave the son away. But this is what he had in in exchange, right here. But the open fields beyond the town, the surrounding villages were given to Caleb. Instead of losing momentum in the loss, he gained momentum. Why? Because he prevailed. You can't do that without a significant amount of wholeness working in your life. There are people who go through loss who are dead, disappeared, done, finished, over. Let me give you the definition really quick. Here is the definition of the spirit, a different spirit, the spirit of Caleb. Here it is. Five words. I'm just as strong now. I'm just as strong now. We need that. We need that. That sounds like passion to me. I've got just as much faith, hope, courage, boldness, anointing, confidence, determination, expectation now as I did then. That sounds like prevailing to me in spite of all the hardship and disappointment and all the junk and the crud and everything that he went through. He said, listen, I'm just as strong now. I've been through all of that stuff. I've experienced all that stuff. I'm just as strong now as I ever have been. Sounds like promise to me. Sounds like Caleb saying, God, I'm going to be standing in my inheritance. I'm going to be there when you give it to me. I'm going to be there. I'm not going to be missing in action. I'm not going to be A-W-O-L. I'm going to be there. Let me tell you something. Everybody in church will amen every bit of that. But I want to tell you something. There are empty seats next to you that used to be filled with people who a year ago would have amen that too. Who are no longer walking with God. I got a legal sized pad full of names. You know why? Because they didn't have a different spirit. Caleb said, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm getting through all of that and I'm going to be there. Let me ask you a question. You're going to be serving Jesus in six months' time? Oh, absolutely, Pastor. What about in a year? What about in five years? What about after the loss and after the disappointment and after all the hardship? Are you still going to be serving Jesus then? You will if you have a different spirit. I'm telling you what, it's easy. It is so easy to amen in the green chair. Hey, and listen, I got my own green chair. I'm right with you. I'd be in the back going, yeah, pastor, yes. This is a guy that lived it. When he got on the other side, he looked back, nobody else made it. 
But he had a different spirit. A different spirit. We need the spirit. Now here's the great thing. Do you know that God, from time to time, God will take the spirit that's on one person and put it on another. <laughs> he will do it. He will do it. He did it for Moses. He put it on the 70. He did it for David. He put it on the 400 men in the cave. He did it for Elijah. He put that spirit on Elisha, and then he put it again on John the Baptist, right? Same spirit. Same spirit. And then he did it with Jesus. He took the spirit that was on Jesus, put it on the 120, and then said, hey, by the way, anybody else that wants to get in on this, you can. <laughs> Which means me and you. God will take a spirit that's on somebody and he will put it on somebody else. I want to ask God to do that today for me. I want to be able to stand before the Lord and God say, you know what? You got a different spirit. You got a different spirit because you made it all the way. You made it all the way. You want it? I, I want it. That's his part. What's my part? I have to be committed to allowing Jesus to work his work of wholeness in my life on a continuing basis. Here's a good question. When is the last time Jesus dealt with me about something significant? When's the last time I had to turn and repent? I'm not talking about because of some sin. I'm talking about because of a pattern that was going to slay me and trap me if it wasn't resolved. You see, that's my part. I have to be open to the dealings of God. See, we come before God and say, okay, I want the Spirit, good, okay. But I have to foster that. I have to do what Caleb did. I have to walk in a process of wholeness with Jesus. I had to do it this week. It's it old, but it's good. Because little by little by little, the image of Jesus is coming to pass in us. And I want to finish the whole thing. I want to be like Caleb. Hey, I'm here, God. I'm here to claim. Let's ask God to do it. I believe Tower City Church needs this spirit on us to take what God's given us, to do what God's called us to do.